Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's call. My name is Micah Pepper, and I work with Telos Group in the DC office today. Um, thank you guys for joining today's call on the Learning Core. We're excited to have our first um, meeting today. And I would like to now introduce our speaker today, Sarah Stern. Uh, Sarah is our program coordinator of the Telos Tables and also Learning Core at Telos Group. Um, so Sarah, the floor is yours. Thanks, Micah. Um, so welcome everyone. I've met all of you. I know all of you who are here in the room live with us, but I know there are some folks who can't join us live today. So we are recording this session. All the learning course sessions won't be recorded. Um, I'll get into the format in just a moment, but just so you know, like it's recorded, but it's not for super public consumption, just for the other folks who are gonna be part of this community who weren't able to join us live today. So you've met Micah. Micah is our fantastic fellow who will be with us throughout this program. A couple of the other Telo staff might be kind of in and out. I'm really excited about the fact that this is a chance for you all to have a little bit more face time with different folks from the Telos network and team. And today we're super lucky to be joined by Yvonne, Yvonne Holden. Um, before we dive into who Yvonne is and kind of our, our chat for today, I do want to start just by going over some of the format of what the Learning Core will be. Y'all have been super patient as we figured out this new program, and I'm super grateful you've showed up and you're interested in joining this. And as we move forward together, I think things will get clearer format-wise and we'll have more and more opportunities to engage. January is always a little bit of a weird month to dive in and get started. Um, while I'm going over this, I know all of you, but if you want to introduce each other to yourselves in the chat and just put in who you are and where you're calling in from, would love for you to start getting to know each other as well. So the idea behind the Learning Core is we all care about Telos, we all care about peacemaking. We know there are so many issues to dive into in the US, abroad, and it's really hard to do that alone. So the Learning Core is hopefully going to be an opportunity for us to learn more together then also to offer space for us to process, to learn, to share where we've succeeded as peacemakers, where we're maybe falling short and struggling, and to kind of have that hive mind community mentality around, we're doing this together in community, we're forming communities across lines of difference, and we're kind of putting into practice what we talk a big talk about when it comes to peacemaking. So January, as I said, is kind of a, an odd month as we kick it off, but moving forward, each month we'll have a little bit more of a, a limited scope or theme. At the top of the month, Telos will send out an email with some background context, how Telos is thinking about the topic, um, why it's when we're diving into with some suggested reading and resources. Nothing too big, nothing too much of a heavy lift, hopefully, but just a chance for us to all kind of targetedly look into an issue together. We'll have a call that's more like this with a guest who we're inviting in to learn from, learn deeply from. Um, they'll usually share with us and then we'll do a Q&A or have some time to discuss what they've presented without them in the room. Um, we'll send some follow-up emails and materials and the Zoom recording with that guest for those who aren't able to join live. And then the fourth part will be more of an off-the-record community discussion. Um, that one won't be recorded. It's a chance for us to connect as a community, to process what we've learned over the course of the month through our independent reading, through conversations with other Learning Core members, through the, the guest speaker and invitee, and to really talk about what it means to do this from a personal standpoint and hopefully compare how that work is going for us and in our communities. So that's kind of the format. You'll get an email with a little bit more of that too. But just so you know how this meeting and you know this kickoff kind of fits into the bigger context of what we're envisioning, that's what we're looking forward to. The last piece before we dive into Yvonne and why we're all here today is we're also going to set up um, a Slack channel. I am new to Slack. If you've never heard of Slack, that's totally fine. We will learn how to navigate it together. Um, it's a pretty easy to use kind of messaging system where instead of having one thread where everything gets jumbled, people can reply to specific comments or topics. And that'll be a really great place for us to start discussions, continue discussions, message, message each other individually, and um, engage when we're not in person together. Again, I'm really hoping this is a, a community where we can troubleshoot together and share what we're doing well and, and ask any of those questions that might not have time to be aired kind of in settings like this. So more information on that to come too. Don't panic if that feels like it's way too technologically difficult. Um, I am learning, we can learn together and it'll be great. So for today, um, we're starting kind of at 10,000 feet. The learning core won't just stay theoretical. But y'all have come to Telos from different backgrounds. You have engaged Telos in different ways. 
Some of you have traveled in the regions through the US South that we travel to, others haven't. So we wanted to take today, while we've got Yvonne, before she starts traveling again, to do a little bit of that deep dive into what is Restore US? Why are we calling it Restore US? And what are some of the guiding questions or principles we want to be asking ourselves as we go through these months and bring in other guest speakers? So Yvonne is the former director of visiting experience and operations at Whitney Institute, which if you haven't heard of it, is a nonprofit whose mission is to educate the public about the history and legacies of slavery in the US. Um, this happens on the historic site of Whitney Plantation. Some of you will have been there. Others, if you haven't yet, highly encourage a visit. Um, so that's one hat that Yvonne wears is her experience at Whitney. And now we're super lucky that she's our director of Restore US for Telos. Um, so Yvonne, thanks so much for joining us today. We're really, really lucky to have you here. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm really excited to be here and hello to all of the people who are joining us. Um, I can't see everybody. So if there are people in this group that have come on a Southern experience with Restory, um, I'm sure I met you at Whitney. And if you have not, hopefully we'll meet each other in person again soon, or we'll be, meet each other in the future um, on a Restory trip. Awesome. Well, so for today, we're just going to kind of have a, a question and answer time with Yvonne. Yvonne is super knowledgeable about a huge body of work, but we are really curious about what you're wondering. So I've got a couple of questions to start off with, Yvonne. Then if you all want to add some questions to the chat or after, after Yvonne and I go back and forth a little bit, we'd love to draw you in. So whether you've got anything now that you're dying to ask her or if anything comes up as she's speaking, um, this is a great chance to ask her those questions directly rather than having to go through me and I'll say, I'll get back to you on an email. So Yvonne, just to kind of get us started, like I said, um, we call this program Restore US for a reason. Why is that an important framing for us as we engage on this work together? Restory, I believe is really important to phrase what it is that we're doing using that word because um, so many of us, especially in the last few years are on this journey to really understand what our what the totality of our American history is. Um, we've all grown up at different um, times and different generations, but I think one of the things that um, binds all of our knowledge of who we are together is our ideas about what it is to be an American that we've been taught not only through our communities, but also um, within our school systems as well. And although those things hold true, it's only such a small sliver of our understanding of ourselves. And so in an effort for us to get the full scope of who we are, um, it's important for us to be able to restory that narrative, not take away from this narrative that gives us such a firm sense of identity, but to add to it, and but to do it in a way that is more inclusive. Thanks so much for that context. Um, one of the themes we're looking forward to diving into specifically is mass incarceration or questions of how the carceral system today is tied to slavery, is tied to the history, and as you kind of said, how the past connects to the present and what we're going to do about it. Um, what are some of the guiding thoughts that it might be helpful for us to keep in mind as we embark on this journey? What are pitfalls that you've seen people fall into as they go through this work or questions that you think it would be helpful for us to kind of keep at the forefront of our minds as we engage these guest speakers or, or go on this work together? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a part of the journey of restoring our understanding of who we are is that learning new information is going to really challenge um, our core beliefs. And it's going to make us question them in a way that sometimes leaves us a little bit, um, a little bit, uh, sometimes when we're feeling overwhelmed with the new information, we sort of dig our heels into our, our sort of areas of comfort. Um, we sort of sometimes double down and really dig our heels in because there's something about that information that, you know, we feel personally like sort of implicated or attacked by. And so I think that especially surrounding the topic of mass incarceration, it is a large topic and we could easily launch into it and talk about um, the historical roots of our carceral system, but there's a lot of other nuanced and more layered issues to it. And where we fall on that spectrum will be 
will be different, will be varied. Some people get into the conversation of mass incarceration from a full abolitionist standpoint. Some people get into the a topic of mass incarceration from a more like, I, I don't wanna necessarily say conservative, but more like sort of traditional sort of like, you know, we really believe that this system is something that we need within our communities. And so we fall within that spectrum. And I feel that sometimes the pitfalls of that is that these conversations don't take into account that full range of perspectives that we all have. And it doesn't allow for people to communicate those perspectives in an atmosphere of genuine grace and care and understanding. And so I feel that the pitfalls are, the pit, the largest pitfall is um, our inability to be able to have this conversation from all of those viewpoints in an atmosphere that really is um, an atmosphere of respect. And uh, what am I trying, what word am I looking for? Um, grace, it's not, it's, those things are there, but, uh, but also just um, the invitational space that TELUS creates. Um, throughout all of its programming. And so that would be the largest sort of pitfall is just, you know, the inability to be able to actually fully talk about these things um, and our internal sort of reaction to a challenging information. But the wonderful thing about TELUS and the reason, one of the many reasons why I'm now with the organization is I think what we do very well is create, you know, um, these communities of trust um, and these atmospheres of trust, which is also one of the reasons why these uh, sort of discussions won't be recorded. Um, and so we can really be candid with each other and really have a conversation without the fear that we might be saying something wrong or entering into a conversation with an unpopular sort of viewpoint or what we feel is unpopular viewpoint. Um, so yeah, hopefully that that was a helpful answer. <laughs> yeah, that's super helpful Um, to put exactly what you just said through the lens of the principles and practices of peacemaking, because for me, that's a very helpful guiding framework for all of us as we go through this. Mm -hmm. What I hear you kind of saying are those two principles and practices of um, listening to understand and holding competing perspectives in tension, Absolutely. both for within this group and community and then also for our guest speakers. Um, our hope is that everyone who we invite will challenge everyone. There might be some folks who are more aligned with your way of thinking already. There might be some folks where you're like totally vehemently disagree, but wanna come and learn from your perspective and see what you say. Um, so I invite you all to, to join us and to kind of join that posture at Telos of listening to understand, not to refute or to disagree right away. And then to hold those perspectives in tension with your own, with others in this group and with um, you know others that we might have guests that come who vehemently disagree with one another. So that's how we hopefully will, you know, engage as a community, engage with our guests and do this work with, as Yvonne was saying, that kind of room for grace and understanding and a, a lot of, uh, a lot of, I think also vulnerability is the word that I'm going to use. Um, this is hard work and it's work that's deeply personal. It's hard not to get into the deeply personal parts of it. And so, um, yeah, I'll, I'll pause there. I can go off on my soapbox on that for a while. I, you all have heard me if you've, if you've been on other events with me, you know what that soapbox sounds like. Um, uh, can I say one more thing? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the, also too, just from a, a, a programming point of view and also somebody who has uh, been responsible for uh, educating the public about these histories for many years is one of the pitfalls I think that sometimes um, that we make on our end is having about a topic this large and only doing it once, you know, trying to fit all of it into a one hour session. And I think that one of the wonderful things about the learning core is that we will be having this conversation over a long period of time, which will allow us to really take care and spend the time that a topic of this magnitude deserves. Absolutely. So with, with that idea of this is a big topic, a community a conversation continuing over time, one of the other things we'll be doing with that is diving into some historical context and then connecting that to where we are today. Um, as someone, Yvonne, who teaches the deep history or has taught the deep history at Whitney is intimately familiar with a lot of the details of that and then also does this work now and brings folks to see communities in the present. What are some of the things that you suggest we we watch out for or we lean into as we're kind of looking at past and present together and how we can learn from the past without drawing unhelpful parallels to the present. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. That's a really um, wonderful question. I, 
to generally speak right now with this introductory session. We'll get into it much later, but to make a sort of a um, sort of a broad um, to give you a more like a large uh, answer to this question right now is I feel that in when we're speaking about this topic, um, it has become really not only just easy, but very popular for people to talk about our carceral state as a system, basically the carceral state as it exists today, as if it were the same thing as slavery pre-1865. Um, although our, our carceral system today, we can find roots of it in slavery, the system as it exists today, it is not the same as slavery. There are elements that obviously, especially if we're speaking about um, prisons like Angola, the connections to slavery are really, are there on the surface. We can talk about a place like Angola and very much talk about the reality and the very present day conditions there that we can link back to slavery, but that is not representative of the entire carceral state. And so it's really easy to reduce um, what is happening today to saying that, oh, it's exactly like slavery. And when we do that, we are completely painting over and um, completely washing out all of the nuance that that actually exists. It's like our system exists because for various reasons. And those reasons become painted over when we say it's the same as slavery, when we just reduce it down to that. And so um, I feel that uh, that pitfall, that um, that reaction that, you know, many people, and I'm sure maybe people in this um, room have had that conversation with others who are like, the carceral state today, the exact same as slavery. There are roots, but it's not the exact same thing. And if we talk about it in such reductive and simplistic terms, we won't really be able to really see it for what it is. And if some of you are interested in reform of it, we won't really be able to get to those finer points of how we can reform a system um, that actually works with, um, with our shared morals and ethics within our communities. One note coming out of that too, if there's ever a, a term or phrase we use, like carceral system, where you're like, that's not landing, I'm not quite sure what you mean, or I think I know what you mean, but I'm not entirely positive, um, always feel free to drop a question or comment in the chat and clarify, or you can private message us. There's so many different phrases people use when we talk about this work, and some of that comes from people have different contexts and different perspectives, right? Some people talk about the criminal justice system. Other people talk about the criminal legal system and words have power, language is important. So we're always happy to also like pause and unpack why we're using a specific phrase or not using a specific phrase. So just wanna open that up and make sure you all know we're not trying to go over anyone's head. I mean, I've done a lot of learning and research. We'll continue doing a lot of learning through this process. Um, so wanna make sure we're not losing anyone with some of that language. Yeah. Uh, wanna open, go ahead. Oh, I was about to say thank you for language, Sarah. I just want to chime in super quick and then I'll shut up too. <laughs> I think that like, also too, we're students on this journey. Language is constantly changing as well. And so if you have, if you, if there's a phrase one of us uses that, you know, all, like has fallen out and you're like, actually we're using this phrase now, please let us know as well. Because again, this is, we're not going to have these conversations perfectly, but it's important for us to have these conversations so that we can get to the place where we all want to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. So on that note then, Yvonne, can you dive in a little bit and explain what carceral means or when we talk about the carceral system, what we're talking about? Um, woo, that's a, Sarah, I, I'm otherwise gonna, I can take my, I'm gonna put, put that one back to you. That is not a question you've asked me yet. So we haven't even talked oh, about no. that. Sarah, yeah. what is it yeah, when, is... when you talk about the carceral system? Yeah. So <laughs> when I, <laughs> when I talk about it, so I, the reason I landed on this language kind of to ask the question and to frame it, I think about this as including anything from when someone's arrested to someone goes through the criminal legal system, to someone's put on trial, to someone's put in prison, to someone is, you know, out on parole, um, to kind of talk about that system of incarceration. It's not just the time while they're in an institution, but it's kind of the whole process and an institution and system they have to go through. Um, so when I think about this, like I, I don't separate any one of those pieces out. If we're talking about someone's experience, if we're talking about the impact on them or where we have an opportunity to make change, um, to me, carceral kind of covers all of that. Uh, 
like when I've when I've engaged folks or I've heard folks talk about the criminal legal system, I think that really focuses on the like the trial portion or the evidence portion or the the part that happens before someone is incarcerated. Um, where for me, yeah, I feel like I'm repeating myself now, but carceral kind of helps me understand that whole trajectory that someone would go through as they're experiencing this system. Yvonne, if you want to correct me or jump in or add anything or, or anyone else, please feel free. No, Sarah, that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, catching up on some questions in the chat here too. Um, Linda Ruth asks if we'd include immigration detention as well. I think it's definitely related, like similar but different. Again, you know, not drawing unhelpful parallels, but talking about these as related systems, absolutely. Hmm. Um, yeah, so thanks, Lauren. Uh, Yvonne, you mentioned Angola. I think that this is a, a really helpful context for folks who haven't traveled with us to hear and understand. Um, can you tell a little bit about what Angola is and how it's different or why it would compare to slavery more than another prison? Yes, hopefully I can do this and uh, answer this question in a couple of minutes, not in an hour long presentation, because that is a whole that is a whole topic I can easily get down the rabbit hole with. But I'm going to pull this back, back, back really briefly to give that um, uh, that site a little bit of context. So the largest slave traders um, during the U.S. domestic slave trade were are some of the largest. They were they were up there. Um, was a firm called Franklin, Armfield, and Ballard. Um, they had offices in Virginia, New Orleans, and Natchez. And so they would transport people from, uh, they would transport enslaved people from um, the upper Southern states, primarily Virginia, Maryland, and North Carolina, and bring them down um, to the South and sell them to plantations, you know, in the Southern region of the United States um, after, like right around, right after the abolishment of the transatlantic slave trade. So Franklin, um, of course, you know, being slave traders, um, also had a plantation. Um, he had a cotton plantation, a massive amount of acreage um, in Louisiana, and he named it Angola, um, Angola Cotton Plantation. Um, after the end of the war, um, after his death, um, the Civil War, when we say the war, I'm in the South. So when we say the war, we're talking about the Civil War. <laughs> so um, after the Civil War, his widow leased Angola prison to the Louisiana State Penitentiary um, system, which has become Louisiana State Penitentiary to this day, otherwise known as Angola prison. Um, Angola today um, still um, has cotton that is grown. Um, by the individuals who are incarcerated there. So if you visit Angola um, prison, you will drive through the cotton fields that were originally planted by enslaved people that is still being cultivated primarily by Black men um, through forced coercion. You will see them in same uniforms um, crouched over picking and cultivating this crop with men on horseback with guns supervising them. And so not to not draw that direct parallel at Angola would just be, you know, like denying what's right before your eyes, not only the, his the history of it being started by some of the largest slave traders in the United States, but it's still growing the crop that was originally grown on that plantation. And that's just um, a brief history of Angola. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, Sharon, I don't want to call you out, but I'd love to invite you to ask your question. I'm not sure I entirely understand what you're trying to get at. Um, if you don't want to, no pressure. And if if you want to ask it, but you don't want it recorded, Mike can also pause the recording while we chat about a question we don't want on the record, um, and we can resume after. So wanted to throw that out there, too. Well, I'm Okay, I'm sorry. I might be the only person who is um, kind of a little bit um, uh, trying to grapple with everything going on. But um, for this first session of Restory, my question, um, Yvonne, was um, how did we take this big Restory and then narrow it down to this mass incarceration? And I just wanted, so I, I must have missed something probably in introduction when I was reading, you know, the chat, but, um, and is this the focus of Restory, ma ma mass incarceration? No, it is not the only focus of Restory, but, you know, um, this is a part of the larger 
understanding of our shared and collective history and narrative so we can have context about the issues that we're dealing with today. Um, so although this is uh, this is one piece, it is quite a large piece. <laughs> and so um, being an ambitious group, as we all are, of course, we took one of the largest topics and made it the first topic that we are going to discuss. But we talk about um, there are many other um, there are many other narratives and histories um, that tie in. But one thing about these narratives and histories is they all inform each other. Um, we can't, of course, talk about mass incarceration if we're not talking about um, uh, convict leasing that happened in the early 20th century. And we can't talk about convict leasing if we don't understand um, what happened um, in the aftermath of the Civil War. And we can't talk about the aftermath of the Civil War without understanding what happened during slavery. Um, and so all of these themes do tie in together. Is that a helpful, okay. is that a helpful that answer? Is, that is very helpful. Um, okay. Thank you. Yes, of course. Yeah, and to jump on that too, um, one of the things that will happen, as Yvonne said, this is a, an ongoing conversation, different themes and themes will come up again and again. Um, and especially in sessions, this is kind of a hybrid, we've got Yvonne, but it's also our first session kind of getting to know each other, asking these questions, um, especially in the sessions where we don't have a guest and it's us kind of doing this work together and processing together. That's really be more of an opportunity and chance for you all to bring the things at the forefront of your minds when we're doing this three story work together too. Um, so if mass incarceration isn't the issue that lights a fire under you, but another one is, there'll be plenty of space and opportunity to bring that up too. Um, it was hard to pick where to start, right? This is this is ongoing lifelong work. So figuring out where we dive in together, there is no right answer. There is no one answer. Um, and yeah, invite invite those questions or invite those thoughts of how this connects to different aspects that you're most passionate about or have experience with too. So don't feel like it's just kind of narrowing and we're staying narrow. We're going to go, you know, broad to narrow to broad to narrow and kind of, I hope for the better, go all over the place and pull these threads together. Any other questions for Yvonne? Or more generally, or for the group? Buzz, go ahead. Well, first of all, hi to everybody. Great to see some faces I haven't seen in months. It's just wonderful. Uh, to those who have uh, new hairstyles, I've, I pass on them all. They all look great. Good job. <laughs> um, Yvonne, I'm so glad you're on board. I was able to get there some years ago. I, I carry my figurine with me from the Whitney Plantation. Those of you who haven't been there, they do a wonderful job of kind of allowing you to identify with one of the slaves, in this case, Hunt and Love, um, who may have worked there. Um, and you kind of, that's kind of how you make your connection to what the horrible things that went on at this, this sugar cane plantation. Um, 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 uh, uh, an immediate question I want to ask real quickly, maybe we could do it offline, Yvonne, is it, are they, um, what I recall there being there are what I would call slave cabins. Um, has there ever been any discussion about, um, because it is in this area, generally up and down the East Coast, there are people who are doing overnight stays in such facilities. Has that ever been the case at Whitney? I know you're not there anymore, but yeah. No, no, it hasn't. I mean, and I just, uh, I've only been um, not in my position at Whitney for what, this is my third month. So it's very recent. Um, no, Whitney was not a plantation that was open to public visitation before we opened it as a museum of slavery. Um, so it was a working sugarcane farm until 1975. Um, the family that still owned it at the time um, sold a lot of the sugarcane fields to a sugar family family that manages the majority of the historic acreage. They kept the historic structures and continued up until the early 80s to use the big house, the main house, as a place for family reunions um, for the family who, who most of them were born there, you know, who most of them were born there. Um, and so after they sold it in the 80s, they sold it to, it's a big story, they sold it to a big, um, petrochemical company that had plans, those plans fell through. So this is a long way of saying that because it was an operational farm until the 70s, occupied by an owning family until the 80s, um, not open to public visitation or tourism, there were still people living in those cabins until 1975, um, which is why they're still there, which is why they're still there. And so 
the site and its original structures were preserved because they were continued to be used. And because it wasn't a site of plantation tourism, the structures didn't get rehabbed or used for any sort of um, uh, uh, just um, like tourist or luxury or um, into like plantation tourism of renting private facilities or anything like that. Um, the family that last lived in that cabin, we still have a really close relationship with, and their descendants also work at Whitney Plantation um, as interpreters, as, you know, visitor service representative, as management um, board members, uh, directors, and the like. And so we're very protective about those structures and would never, ever even consider them being rented out for really any use unless it had to do with public programming, which supported the education of the history. Thank you. Buzz, I wonder if you saw the same article that I saw a couple months ago then that was talking about buildings that weren't historically protected sites or sites of recognition and remembrance um, that were ending up on sites like Airbnb and VRBO. And I thought that was a really interesting conversation to open about what it means to remember in space and and what it means to hold those sites not as like happy sacred spaces but as spaces that aren't value neutral and can't just be kind of reintegrated or sold as an experience to travelers if i can find that article i'll send it out in the post trip follow up email i'm not very good at googling and facilitating at the same time um <laughs> but i don't know if other people saw that but that's what you're your, your question made me think of too and the importance and i think this will be a theme that comes up for us throughout the importance of um, space and sacred space as how we remember or fail to remember as well. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? Yeah, I had a quick question. Um, probably for both of you guys, I'd love to hear your opinions on it. So in our discussions of um, like what happened in history, how does language really impact a discussion and our understanding of that history? Um, one idea I had was thinking through like the terms enslaved person versus just slave and aspects like that. And then how can we be um how can we be open to that and engage in it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the uh, the journey of learning how to speak about our histories um, is really important and particularly with the use of language and always looking to, in some cases, improve our language or improve the definitions of the terms that we already use as well. But language definitely, um, the words we use influence the way that we think about subjects, about people, about places as well. Um, with the with understanding, for example, or the example that you just used, the term slave versus enslaved, um, is that these individuals were not objects. They weren't inanimate objects. They were individuals, they were people who were forced into a position um, of being enslaved, of somebody else actively enslaving them. So it also not just speaks to the conditions that this person lived under it also speaks to the other party as well. There is another party that actively made the decision to enslave another human being. And being enslaved was not the totality of that person or that person's personality or their entire life experience. It was a force system that they lived under. Um, they were individuals just like us that had rich um, emotions, um, amazing intellect, and they were continuously put into a position of enslavement, right? Um, they And so it helps us humanize people um, instead of reducing them to objects. And, you know, and this is definitely not an indictment on the language that, or people who use the language, because we've all, I mean, I grew up using the term slaves, you know? I grew up using the term slaves. Um, and it's not until the last 20 years that there you've seen a shift and you've seen more historians and more academics really um, defining the difference between people and really pulling out the experiences of those who were enslaved and then using these terms in order to um, help humanize people that had been dehumanized for so long, not only during the times that they lived, but continue to be dehumanized through these limiting terms um, for so many years after. 
So that's just one way. That's just one way why language is important. It is expands our thoughts. And I'll tell you this, um, just a little to be candid and just to, so you guys know, when I first uh, started working at Whitney, um, this is language that I had to adopt. Um, and, and it wasn't easy. It was really challenging. And I thought that, you know, me constantly using the term enslaved became too much of a mouthful because I would be standing there speaking about enslaved people and using the term multiple times. And I was like, this, this is just so much. And I felt at first that it was such a fatigue, but I pushed through it. And now it's such, it's really helped me expand my understanding, not only of the history, but also it challenged myself. It's like, oh, so, and I thought this, and I had this inner sort of dialogue with myself being like, oh, I'm uncomfortable constantly using this term and people get the point, right? And then I realized it had nothing to do with the term itself. It had everything to do with me relearning and restoring, you know, this narrative. And I was like, so like just uncomfortable and a little bit exacerbated. And I was like, people will get it. People will get it. But I really challenged myself and I pushed through it and now it's become a natural extension and it's really expanded the way that I can even talk about the history. So just that one change and me pushing through, me feeling uncomfortable about something and me really just sticking with it actually helped me expand my understanding of the history and it continues to help me understand the people who were forced into that position. And I just wanted to share that because people when they speak see me speak about the history, we'll talk about how well I do it and how they could never do it. But what they don't see is how I myself struggled with it. And I feel that when we talk about and we're candid about our own journeys, it helps people in theirs because I can't be the only person who felt those things, you know? And so it helps people. It's like, we're not perfect and we're going to feel the way that we feel about something. But sometimes it's important to just stay the course and to continue to commit yourself to doing something and doing something really well and being respectful in the ways that ultimately lead us all to a place of connection. I appreciate that, Yvonne. And I also think this is an important question too for how we start to do this work in our communities. Um, one of the things we believe at Telos is that culture change is upstream of politics. And as important as political advocacy is and, and pushing is, changing culture is equally important to make that happen. And having a conversation, if, if this comes up and someone is talking about slaves, engaging them and saying, here's what I learned, here's why I would like to use the phrase like someone who was enslaved, not a slave, using that as an opportunity to invite someone into this work together, not to have it be kind of a, an us versus them, or I know more than you, or I've arrived and done the work and you haven't, but have that be an entry point to invite someone in to start asking their own questions more. That's a really, I don't want to say easy, but it's an accessible way to start doing this work in our own communities. Um, and always totally valid to say like exactly what Yvonne did. I'm learning. I'm trying. I'm not going to get it right every time. I slip up and use language that I don't, don't want to use. But leaning into those moments as, as ones of curiosity of why is this language different than what I, I used to know? Um, an opportunity. How do I do do that verb of restory, not just, you know, the idea of restory, but how do I actively restory in the language we use and how we talk about this with our communities? Any other questions before we move towards um, the call to action for today? Great. Well, if any come up, please feel free to put them in the chat or jump in. Um, like we've said multiple times, this is the start of the conversation, not the end of the conversation. But one of the other pieces that we really want to focus on with Restory isn't just our internal learning, but how we put all of this learning into practice. And every time we won't have, you know, a targeted advocacy campaign or a donation ask or, or things like that. But um, one of our communities that we work really closely with in Restory is uh, the community in Selma, Alabama. Yvonne, I'll invite you to talk more about what that community has meant historically and, and in the present, if you're okay with that. Otherwise, I can do it, but you spent more time with them. Um, but this past weekend, they were hit by a, a really devastating tornado. Um, and this is a community that is deeply resilient, is not just one of historical significance, but is one where folks are doing really important continued civil rights advocacy today. 
Um, so our call to action today will be around Selma, um, sharing its story, and then also, you know, putting out that call for resources of investing in a community that's been historically underinvested in, um, not just as they rebuild from a tornado, but as they build opportunities for folks to continue this work on the ground in one of the most like important and significant civil rights historical cities. So Yvonne, um, not to put you on the spot, but why why is Selma important to you? Or like, why is Selma important to Restory, not just for historical significance, but today? Yeah, I'll talk about um, myself, why uh, Selma's um, important to me, because there's so many reasons why Selma is important. And historically speaking, Selma is just an extraordinary, its history is extraordinary. And for a place as what I guess I'm a big city girl. I'm originally from Chicago. And so unfortunately, I would say for a place as small as Selma, um, population wise, um, and also where it's located, its impact on, on who we are today has been outsized, of course. Um, Selma um, is a important to me because, you know, my family history is directly impacted through many of the um, historical events during civil rights that happened in Selma. Um, and one of the, just visiting Selma and having the privilege to be in Selma so many times each year, connecting with the individuals who are still there doing really important work um, has profoundly, pr continues to profoundly shift the way that I myself move in my own communities. But um, more specifically, I think that for me, going to Selma um, and consistently spending time there is reminds me of quite a few things. Number one, the it consistently shows me examples of how communities um, are resilient and how communities continue to support each other and how that work actually happens. Um, the importance of spending time in places, developing relationships with people, because ultimately none of the work that we do can really take root unless we actually spend time with each other um, and actually open ourselves up to be vulnerable and supporting each other. And that's something I see in overabundance in Selma. There's such generosity of spirit in Selma, Alabama, and that generosity doesn't just extend into how you're received within um, within any of the experiences that we take as Restory, be it um, in the local coffee shop that got completely demolished by the tornado or in a small business like Queen City Kale or even at the Selma Center for Nonviolence and Reconciliation, how we're welcomed into those spaces are are extraordinary, but the hospitality and the extension of themselves and sharing their histories with us, um, from it being Mama Callie, who shares her experience as an individual in that community, to Joanne Bland, who shares her experience being on the bridge during Bloody Sunday, and how those stories continuously resonate. Sharing those histories is not easy. Sharing those histories with strangers that you may never see again can't be easy, but they continuously open up themselves to everybody that visits. And those visits are impact each and every one of us. And so Selma is an extremely important space. It was not only a city that was one of the richest cities in the United States pre-Civil War, had a tremendous um, contribution during the Civil War, but sort of fell by the wayside um, after the end of the war. But that community is still there. That community is still working, still organizing, still working to thrive. And there's still significant setbacks um, that they continue to push back against there. And so I think that overall, this is a long way to say that the continued resiliency of that community is something that is extremely impactful to me. And I feel it every time I'm there. Thanks, Yvonne. I really appreciate that answer. And I appreciate that you let me put you on the spot like that. <laughs> um, one thing I'll add to that too, and I'm going to put a donation link in the chat, not just for us, but if if one of the actions you can take is to share a little bit about if you've been to Selma, your experience there and share the link with your friends and family, or take this opportunity to learn more about Selma, either historically or today. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that's given me so much hope and how they are are asking for support after this tornado and this strategy is that they've done it collectively there are a lot of organizations and businesses who have their own fundraising, have their own networks, and instead they've collectively put out this, this call for support for the community as a whole, um, trusting that they as a community know best what their immediate needs are, what their long-term needs are, and how they want to do this together to rebuild. So it's not everyone for themselves, it's it's Selma together doing this. Um, so I've put the link in the chat and that'll be in the um, follow-up email as well, 
But part of why I also wanted to bring it up on this call is we had hoped to have a guest from Selma for our February conversation around beloved community. Mm -hmm. um, but part of us also putting into practice our principles and practices is part of centering the leadership of the marginalized and the folks most affected is when they are affected, it is the not the right time, right, for us to make a, an ask for them to come and educate us. Um, so hopefully we'll see how things are going. I still hope that guests can join us next month. If not, we'll pivot and do something else that's equally good. Um, but felt like a very timely time to, to bring it up and to mention it. And in the follow-up email, we'll send out some resources to check out those organizations or to learn more about Selma. Um, but this for me has been a really strong opportunity to think about what it means to center the leadership of the marginalized, not just when it comes to learning, but when it comes to kind of taking action or, or sharing the stories or financially supporting as we're able. Um, communities that have given a lot historically, give a lot today and need our partnership right now. Um, that's probably the most of a financial ask I will ever make. I'm not great at asking for money or or for support like that, but um, this feels like a really unique time and opportunity. Um, so I'll stop there. That's enough about that for now. But yeah, that's everything that I wanted to go through for today. We gave you a little bit of an overview of what the program's going to look like. We opened up the conversation with Yvonne, definitely not closing it. Any other questions or comments that any of you would like to share before we end today? I have a question, Sarah, really briefly, and I don't know, um, I might be the person who's out of the loop here. Everybody in this room might be uh, more informed as I, than I am right now. Have we given a list of recommended resources um, yet to the group um, regarding um, just uh, materials that they can engage with to help prep them for the next conversation? Not yet. That's the email that's going to go out later this week. So one of my to do's is connect with you about that. You can see behind the scenes how the sausage is made that we are. Exactly. Yeah. You guys are just led into a little bit of. <laughs> yeah. No. So for future months, you'll have those readings and things in advance for today. I mean, I almost never do pre-work for something I've never shown up to before, and I'm not sure what it's going to be. So we hoped you'd come either join us live or, or see this recording. Um, and now that you know kind of what this will be and what it's about a little bit more that you'll be excited to do some of that work on your own before we come together again. Um, if you have any questions in the meantime, especially if you're like, this isn't quite what I thought I signed up for, or just want some clarity on the format or have any pointed critiques and feedback to give, um, my inbox is always open. Uh, if you've done a lot with Telos before, kind of through our online programming, you know that we are really receptive to feedback and try and, and put that into action and take your input seriously. Um, so inbox is always open. Would love to have a conversation about how this fits the work you all are doing outside of Telos in your communities. And otherwise, we are really excited to see you next time and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. See you next time.